The main sections of the boom are connected to the wings via a fairly narrow lip. I decided to reinforce this join by cutting some thick pieces of white styrene and inserting them between the two boom halves. Now we have something that's starting to look like a venom. Note how the replacement ailerons extend beyond the trailing edge of the wing and go all the way out to the end of the wingtips. While the glue on the booms was still setting, I checked the alignment of the wings, booms and tailplanes and found that one of the booms appeared to be a little bit low. To rectify this alignment problem, I inserted a small wedge of plastic card between the boom joins. This effectively pushed the boom and the tailplane up into the correct position. Once the glue had completely dried, I just trimmed the excess plastic card away and filled the gaps between the boom joins. Before they were assembled, the tailplane parts, uh, wingtip tanks, drop tanks and other small protrusions were drilled and installed with a pin in order to reinforce these potentially delicate joins. You'll remember earlier that I suggested we not glue the lower gun cover in place. That was so that we could work out how much extra weight we need to keep that nose wheel on the ground. And we wouldn't be able to determine that until after the booms, tailplanes and main parts have been installed. If we balance the model uh, on our fingertips around where the main gear legs are installed, then we can see where the centre of gravity is. I installed another seven pieces of uh, lead weight directly behind the resin rear cockpit bulkhead and that was plenty to keep the front wheel on the ground. With all the main parts assembled, now it was time to address some of the small gaps and alignment issues. I used Milliput, a two-part epoxy putty, to fill the narrow gaps around the intake uh, and wing joints. There were also a few small gaps where the vertical and horizontal tailplanes meet the boom. I also managed to uh, gouge some uh, gaps into the top of the horizontal tailplanes when I was drilling out for the locating pins. These were also filled with uh, milliput at the same time. The step at the nose and also the seams where the booms join with the wings were also filled with milliput. The fit of the lower surfaces were almost perfect, the only area needing a bit of attention being the, uh, the rear of the lower gun cover. In these photographs we can see the putty after it's been sanded down. I also added a little detail behind the seat uh, as it appeared in reference photos that there was some kind of object behind the headrest of the ejection seat. Some small details do have to be added from scratch, including the pedo tube. On the FB4, this was a peculiar shape which I replicated using hollow brass tube and some copper wire. On the bottom of the fuselage, two right antennas were added from steel wire. You'll also see two small triangular shapes behind the gun panel. These are small intakes and you'll have to uh, make these yourself. I cut them from uh, the corners of some airfoil section, but you could also make them from sprue. Smaller details such as the fixed uh, spoiler on the outboard of the wing and also the wing fences were installed at this stage. My late method of installing the ailerons left a larger gap than would normally uh, occur and this gap was filled with Gunsey Mr. Surfacer. The model is now just about ready for paint. Here I have installed the racks for the drop tanks and also drilled out holes for the rocket stubs. When I'm building a limited run kit I usually like to start with a coat of primer so that I can see that all the gaps are filled and all the panel lines are still in place. 
My model was destined to be finished as one of the Venoms participating in Operation Musketeer, so the sewer stripes were the first item on the painting agenda. Before painting the yellow, I laid down a coat of uh, white, because yellow is notoriously difficult to cover over the top of any other colour. Extra colour PRU Blue was my choice for the lower surface colour. This is a nice deep shade that provides very low contrast with the dark sea grey on the upper surface. Gunsy Mr. Colour Ocean Grey Lacquer was my choice for the grey colour on the upper surface. The hard-edged upper surface camouflage pattern was masked using a combination of wide Tamiya tape and also sections cut from self-adhesive post-it notes. This delivered the hard edge demarcation that I was looking for. Masking has now been removed from the grey and PRU sections as well as the yellow sections of the sewer stripes. Here we can see that the black sections of the sewer stripes have been added to the wings and some weathering has been applied to the camouflage. Several thin coats of polyscale gloss acrylic were applied before the decals were added to the model. In this photo the decals are in place and a further coat of polyscale flat clear has been applied to seal the decals and flatten the paint job. We still need to finish off the detail parts though. Here I've masked off the PRU blue uh, rails and stubs of the rockets before painting the bodies. Here we can see three of the rockets completed. I've added uh, a small piece of fuse wire and a blob of crystal clear to represent the dangling fuse out of the end of the rocket. You'll note also that I've painted the tips of the warheads in white and a, a few small yellow marks just representing uh, stencils on the warhead of the rockets. Here we can see all of the smaller parts painted and ready to assemble onto the model. One of the very last parts installed was the nose wheel. This is because I wanted the height of the nose wheel to provide the sit of the aircraft that we see in reference photos. In the end, I think I actually cut a little bit too much off the nose wheel strut. You'll see here though that I have uh, pinned the, uh, the nose wheel with a, a length of copper wire to reinforce this important join. You'll be able to see inside the canopy the red ejection pull ring added from fuse wire above the pilot's head. There's also a small rectangle on top of the gun sight representing the, uh, the gun sight lens. I think Classic Airframe's 48 scale Venom kit really captures the chunky, aggressive lines of this classic 1950s fighter. The Venom also carried some of the most colourful markings of the 1950s on its booms and tip tanks, so you won't have to just stop at one. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Jules Bringier from Classic Airframes for the advanced copy of this kit, also John Adams from Air Club for his wonderful assistance and access to uh, brand new and very accurate drawings, and to Derek Pennington for providing his reference photos from his service in the RAF during the 1950s. Now all that's left to do is for you to enjoy building your classic airframes Venom Mark I or Venom FB4.